without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage the director and editor of Capernaum, Nadine Labaki and Constantine Bach. start off by um, asking Nadine a question. Um, this project took a long time for you to put together. You had many, many hours of shooting. Um, can you talk a little bit about the inspiration and then how you sort of began to shape this particular story? Um, I think I, you know, I'm not the only one concerned uh, by this problem. I think that is touching a lot of uh, cities around the world, big cities around the world. Not only in Lebanon, it's not only specific uh, Lebanese problem, the sight of all these kids uh, uh, that you see on the streets that are uh, facing extreme neglect. Uh, and I think this is something that is touching a lot of people. I'm not the only one concerned or obsessed or angry about it. I'm angry about the injustice. Uh, towards these kids that didn't ask to be here and that are um, sort of being punished for our own, our own um, mistakes and our stupid uh, conflicts and wars and, and stupid decisions and uh, stupid systems and governments. So, uh, so I, I just wanted to understand in the beginning why, how, why did we get to this point? And how do we allow ourselves as, as human beings, as societies, how do we permit for such injustice to happen? How do we, how did we get to this point? How did we get to the point where we are inflicting all this suffering uh, among these children? And, and I feel the responsibility also, I feel responsible for it. So I decided to turn this anger into something and, and, and and my tool is filmmaking. This is what uh, I know. So I decided to make a film about it because sometimes you feel the problem is so big and it's so immense. You feel as a human being, as an individual, you're too small to do anything. You're too small. How I, I can maybe help one, one kid, two kids. I cannot, uh, it's impossible that I help all these children. So for me, I decided to use cinema because I truly believe in the power of cinema and I truly believe that a film can change something or can change a person's perspective towards uh, things. Okay. Or at least, um, I might sound, sound too naive, but at, at, at least open the debate about it. So, so I decided to know more and I, I decided to do a lot of research and, and because I wanted to understand what if I want to try to be the voice of these children, uh, I needed to understand who they are. I needed to understand what happens to this kid when he disappears around the corner and I don't see him anymore. Where does he go? Who is he? Who is his family? Uh, how does he think and how does he see? What is his perspective towards this problem? Uh, because we tend to unfortunately dehumanize these children and, and we feel like they belong to, to, to a community, to a system, to a mafia and, and uh, this is what we tend to think and no, we shouldn't help because we are also helping a whole system behind, behind this. So um, I, I wanted to just concentrate on this specific child standing in front of my window. What is he thinking? So. I saw a lot of kids. I went to many places in Lebanon with my co-writers. We, we, we went to the most difficult neighborhoods in Lebanon. We went to prisons for minors, uh, to detention centers. <coughs> we went to, I, I went to a lot of courts because I wanted to understand how does the justice system works also and how does it try to help these children because there's so many cases. Um, and uh, so the idea, after seeing all these kids, ca came very instinctively. If I want to be the voice of this kid and I, I want his voice to be heard, he's going to be shouting out loud something that he's feeling inside and, and he's going to be suing the world 
because the world brought him to, to this life. So this is how the idea came and uh, the idea of this child who's going to sue his parents for giving him life. And through suing his parents, he was also suing a whole system and a whole society. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, I decided that I needed to work with real children who went exactly through the same uh, situation or, or, or lived the same experience. It was impossible for me to think about uh, asking an actor to, to act, and I had a problem with the word acting on the, sh on the, on the shoot. For me, they needed to be. They needed to be exactly who they are and bring their own experience, bring their own um, perspective on things, on life, and try to exp um, express it through the film. So we needed also to be the vehicle for the film as, as, as crew members, a vehicle to them and not the other way around. So we needed to adapt to their rhythm, to their reality, to their truth, and not the other way. So to, uh, to be able to achieve this, we needed time, and time to just wait and wait for that amazing moment to happen, wait for Jonas to do a certain thing or wait for Zane to... So it was, for me, time was essential. And, uh, and not only time, and really, really understanding that we needed to be at their service as a crew. And I had you know, the most amazing crew uh, I can ever dream of because everybody was so passionate and, uh, and everybody understood it. So really, we were like all of us trying to just capture those moments. And of course, there's a written script, there's a solid script, <coughs> because we needed to <coughs> sorry, uh, make sure that we're going somewhere and we needed to, uh, the story needed to make sense. But inside the scenes, uh, we allowed ourselves a lot of freedom and, and just allowed life to, to just um, uh, surprise us and 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 those uh, uh, people those those actors uh, non actors to just surprise us also with, with what they have so there was no they never had a script to just memorize and so it was it was a, a lot of a choreography between fiction and reality and and and, and everything was always uh, this dance between fiction and reality to be able to get this performance. Um, I remember you had said that at one point this was a 12 hour long film. Um, so I'm wondering, Constantine, yes. if you could maybe talk a little bit about the experience of, of working on this to shape what it is now today. We, um, we had, uh, just to give you some, some technical uh, details, we had 500 hours of rushes after six months of shoot. Um, and this was the the first cut of the movie was uh, took us six months to assemble and it was twelve hours long. <laughs> um, and afterwards, we looked at that and we looked at various formats. Could this could this be a different form than what you were seeing here this morning? Um, and we went through many different stages of cutting those twelve hours down to condensing what it is now. There is a five hour version, there is a great four hour version, there is a three hour version. They're all very, very different films um, that maybe one day we'll see the light of day and yes, we, we will. some form. <laughs> we will show it someday. Okay, are there any questions in the audience for the people up here? Yes, way in the back row, uh, on this side. Uh, how did you find Zane specifically? And maybe you could talk about Jonas too. Yeah. Uh, Who isn't really Jonas, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I will get to this. <laughs> Zane, uh, uh, the, the casting process is a very um, uh, specific and difficult casting process because there's no uh, normal additions like we, auditions like what, what we usually do. Uh, in that case, uh, we had um, uh, um, a team of casting recruiters who were amazing and who went really everywhere in Lebanon uh, interviewing kids, interviewing people who were in that in this situation, going to slums, going to um, the most difficult uh, neighborhoods in Lebanon, camps, and really interviewing a lot of people. And Zane was one of uh, the kids that was uh, uh, on the on the streets of Beirut. He was playing with his um, 
friends and uh, the casting director uh, saw him and interviewed him and uh, for me it was uh, um, it, it took really the second answer from Zayn to understand that this, he was going to be uh, Zayn and, and his, his initial um, name in, in the in the film it was named Yahya yeah, his name was Zayn but then when when we saw Zayn and uh, and I wanted it to be as close to reality as possible so we decided to also that his name was going to be Zayn in the film um, and also uh, Jonas uh, oh, is is her name is Treasure in, in real life she's uh, she's a girl <laughs> Yeah, and uh, and she is also exactly like in the film uh, where we met when we met her, uh, she was actually with her mother um, on the set on the stroller uh, in, in the streets of Beirut, and and one of the casting recruiters uh, saw her and interviewed her, interviewed the mother, and filmed the baby, and also love at first sight for me, and she's amazing, and she's also like in the film the daughter of two migrant workers living in Lebanon at, at that moment, and they were completely illegal, no papers, nothing, so uh, Treasure was in the same situation that you see in the film. Invisible child, no papers, nothing, nothing to prove that she exists. So it, it's very, everything is very similar. Uh, most of the things that you see are similar to <coughs> what they are actually living in, in, in real life. Maybe this is a good point just to maybe update the audience on where they are now. I'm sure people yeah. want yeah. to know. No, there's nice stories. <laughs> uh, Zayn, uh, who, uh, who, is, um, who is a Syrian refugee, uh, he's been living in Lebanon for the past uh, maybe eight years. He escaped the war from Syria, so he came to Lebanon. And in Lebanon, he was living in very, very difficult circumstances. As you imagine, there's a lot of... Uh, refugees in Lebanon and uh, the situation is very difficult. There's um, almost a million and a half refugees in Lebanon and we are four million. Uh, so you can imagine the scale of the problem. So most of these families live in very, very difficult uh, conditions and very difficult sit situations. So when we started shooting um, and after the shoot, uh, they, the, the father applied to resettlement in, in, in a country that would accept uh, the family. And after, uh, during the shoot, UNHCR went and interviewed Zayn and his family. And two days after we came back from the screening in, in, in Cannes, I, we received an official letter from UNHCR saying that Zayn and his whole family will be resettled in Norway. And he's there now, it, like, uh, two weeks ago. He, they moved, the whole family moved to Norway. He has, it's like something that is completely for me too good to be true. I still cannot believe that he has a house, a two-story house, five bedrooms. <laughs> uh, he, he has a house overlooking the sea. Zayn is going to go to school with all his fam all his brothers and sisters very soon now. He's starting to learn the language, to adapt. And so, yeah, it's, it's a very nice story. Uh, and also, uh, it's, it's not easy because the situation of each uh, family in the film or each child is very difficult. Most of them don't have papers, so it's very difficult to, to become or to have a normal situation. So in the case of Treasure, also because she was illegal in the country, they had to also go back to Kenya. So now she's back in Kenya with her mother. She's going to go to school. Uh, at least she has papers. She has an identity. She's going to go to school uh, very soon. The situation is not perfect. It's not ideal. But uh, I mean, it's, it's going to, it's one step at a time, one step at a time. We're trying to figure out how, how to, how, how to use this film in a way that it doesn't always only have the kids of the film, but as much as, as many kids as possible. Even if it sounds a bit too naive to think that a film can do something, but I'm hoping it will create some kind of debate where we can be able to talk and, and think and try to find solutions. Are there more questions from the audience? Uh, yes, just in the sort of break row right here. Yeah.
So uh, in the film, you have a lot of anger and resentment um, because of the situations, and initially uh, that's directed at the parents, but then eventually we understand that they are also victims of the same system. So the question is, I guess, how would you like people watching the film to direct this anger? What are you hoping for people to kind of receive out of this? Th this was a very important point uh, that I needed to convey in the film because I myself was in the same situation. This is the first, and I'm sure a lot of people have the same reaction. The same reaction that I personally had when I used to go on the, you know, uh, uh, the research and, and enter these apart apartments and try to understand and talk to people and to families. Uh, sometimes I would go into an apartment, just knock the door, a three-year-old kid would open the door, then I would go inside, I see another one and another one and another one, left alone the whole day with nobody to care uh, for them uh, and uh, just them taking care of themselves and I used to wonder where is the mother how can she do this with a lot of anger a lot of judgment how does she do this where is she where is the father what is this uh, situation this is completely unfair to these kids and and I was the first one to be judgmental but then it always every time when I used to wait for the mother, or sometimes I was just to come back to talk to the mother and see and talk and understand. And it always took me five minutes to just be completely uh, um, blown blow, and, and receive a blow because I used to think, how, how do I allow myself to, to even judge? I've never been in this situation. I've never been in this this mother's shoes. I've never, I've never um, experienced what it feels to leave your baby alone and close the door and 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 go to wherever uh, work or uh, how can I allow myself this? So so for me it was the the the, the court scene was very important because. For me, this court is us, society, being very judgmental. And the judge is us, judging. So it was very important to give those parents this moment where they look at us and tell us exactly what they feel and who they are and why they do what they do. And the scene where she's looking at me, uh, the, the mother is looking at me and telling me, who, who do you think you are? Uh, the, the, it, it, I specifically wanted the scene to, to, to be there because I, I wanted her to just spit out in my face everything she felt towards me. And this is not a scene that is scripted. Kausar, and her name is Kausar, was, is exactly in the same situation. She's, uh, until now, she's not able to register her, child, her children. And until now, uh, until now, she used to give ch her children water and sugar because she didn't have enough money to feed them. And I understood that they are as much as a, of a, vic as a victim as the, their children are. And they, everything, we're all, they're all uh, victims of, of, of a system that is not allowing it, and not allowing anything good to happen. It's a vicious circle that is repeated from the fathers uh, and mothers to the, to the parents, to the, to the children. And uh, and uh, like uh, like uh, Asad in the film is, is saying, but she got married. Uh, of course, you know I can I can uh, I think I can marry her at eleven years old because her mother got married at eleven years old, and it's the same vicious circle that we are not able to get out of because everybody is a, is a victim there. So this is what I wanted you to feel. You know. This roller coaster of positions and emotions and sentiments that this is not black or white. We just need to understand why. This is why the question is out there. How how can we solve it? I'm not saying the parents are the or are the are the uh, are, are the guilty cause, yeah. are the guilty. I'm not saying the parents are guilty. I'm not. I'm just saying there's a problem. This is the problem. We have to acknowledge it. How do we solve it? Well, I think you've gone a long way to um, helping us understand the problem. And uh, thank you so much for helping to transform the way we see this. Thank you all for coming.